Welcome to X-Men Evolution, episode 17 of Cyclops is Waiting for Me, an X-Men animated recap podcast. I'm JC, and in just a couple days after this episode goes live, I'm going to be streaming all weekend long for Extra Life, raising money for the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles via the Extra Life charity, and I'm going to play a lot of video games and probably some tabletop shit, and Rod will probably stop by at two in the morning as <laughs> per our pre-COVID tradition on that. Yeah, and you're going to ice for charity, right? Or get yes. Ice. So any $50 donation, I will send you a cameo style video of me smearing off icing myself. And I also will share the link. There's going to be some other incentives, not all alcohol related, because I don't <laughs> want to die and hangovers last longer once you hit 40. That's the that's the current plan. Very cool. And I'm Rod and I, for one, welcome our AI overlords, just in case. Rod, was... <laughs> all, all of that we talked about was not during the recording. So they yep. have no idea what you're talking about. Now, I just want to put it out there. Because it, yeah, I know it's listening to everything. I mean, there's <laughs> definitely an Amazon-powered device that heard everything I said here. So yeah, there, there's literally four Apple in here that are constantly listening to me. So just this room. That's not even the rest of the house. Anyway, Cyclops is waiting for me. Wait, how we, do we, you have that many Apple devices all listening at once? My phone and my desktop are in front of me. My watch is on me. And I have a home speaker in each room. Okay, that'd do it, yeah. Oh, and there's an iPad, so maybe more. Okay, and good. And I'm not completely sure Lucy's not wired somehow. That's my cat, by the way. You did chip your cat. So yeah, it's probably (laughs) Apple powered. Cyclops is waiting for me is our weekly podcast series where we're going back and watching every single X-Men animated episode we can find along with some bonus episodes. The first series we watched was the original 1992 X-Men animated series that was building up to X-Men 97 that was supposed to come out this year. I guess there's still a chance. Not likely. At time of recording, mid-October, it is not. Mm -hmm. At time of posting, probably not, unless my theory from a few weeks ago about it dropping immediately after Loki finishes. We will find out probably basically this week in real time if that is accurate or not. Oh, that's true. Loki's going to be probably ending. And it's just like Bob Iger on his knees begging people not to unsubscribe. And then they roll the first episode. I'm going to skip to the next line. We are not currently sponsored or affiliated with Marvel, Marvel Animation, (laughs) Disney, or Disney Plus in any way, shape, or form. Some quick reminders, though. We are a recap show about a series that started over 20 years ago. There are going to be spoilers. And if you don't want to spoil it for you, pause the podcast, watch the episode, and then come back. Don't forget to follow us on social media at Cyclops IWFM Pod on Instagram, TikTok, Threads, X. I have not logged into that since. Dude, I, I, don't know I say long. X in, or sorry, I say Threads. I have yeah. not posted on Threads in, oh, in a threads. month easily at this point. Oh, yeah. I'm still posting on Threads. It's still kind of fun because it's like less crazy there yeah but. because they actually like alert you if you say bad words yeah oh did you i don't know if you saw they just added the edit feature i think that's going to win people <laughs> if nothing else you have five minutes after you post to edit your post that's without reasonable. without paying for it without paying for it yeah no oh, okay. and they also have voice notes on there now which is that's part for the course but like the editing yeah. I, that makes sense because if you notice a typo then just change it pretty solid and, and facebook and of course make sure to follow us on your favorite podcast services and also leave a rating and a comment preferably a good one but we can't steer your honesty you mean a review did you mean a review on review. the podcast services I, I, i've been doing youtube for like 10 years then like it's hardwired to do. make sure to favorite do you remember favorites yeah i remember when i started in the industry favorite was still a thing and then they took that away and everybody's like it's gonna ruin my ch-. it didn't ruin anybody's channel That's with every single feature that ever comes up. To be fair, some features have killed channels, but not favorites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now on to this show that we're actually talking about. Today, we're going to be discussing Season 2, Episode 4, titled Fun and Games. It aired on October 20th of 2001. Currently sits at a 6.9 star rating on IMDb. Fun and Games with a 6.9 rating. Oh, hey, it's a funny number. Also, that's, that's kind of sad it's that low. I didn't think this was that bad of an episode. It didn't have the heart of the previous episode. I, th- I think I, I feel like episodes with a little bit more of like the heartfelt moments mm-hmm. do better from a ratings perspective. But this one had, I, I would argue, like a little, I'm not trying to say that this is like, you know, going to be studied in film school or whatever, but I feel like it had a little bit more sophisticated writing than some of the other episodes. And so, some, Rod, and some let's, big reveals. let's both give this like an eight rating on our imdbs and let's see how much that influences the 6.9 star rating let's see, let's let's see how right few now, ratings see. we have to contend against yeah there's like three other ones yeah all of a sudden it pops up to a 7.7 from just our two ratings i need to see how i can do that i do have an imdb pro or i did have a pro account have i paid for that i might not have one anymore you just heard that whole thought process out loud <laughs> Everybody, welcome to uh, yeah. Peek Behind the Curtain. Yeah, this right. is what it's like being friends with Rod. Imagine it's that, but with like vodka involved. Yes, or whiskey more. <laughs> I meant for me. 
Oh, so episode kicks off and it is Stokes County. Did you remember Stokes County, Rod? Yes, I do remember. We we left Juggernaut there and at that time we didn't know if there were any security guards that worked there or not. Right. And then we realized that there is very shitty security guards who work there because there's an alarm starting and the security guard doesn't hear it because he's like listening to headphones and reading a magazine. What makes it even better is he he has like the 90s, not even over the year, you know, those like painful ones that don't enclose over a year that like sit on top. So you can clearly hear outside of those things. Yeah, they did not have full noise canceling back then. <laughs> For those of you who were not alive back then, the headphone games sucked. Yeah, and those were not only were they not noise canceling, they might have just been like noise adding. You know, like they, they <laughs> it was were, just like, it was crackling. just distortion at that point. Yeah. yeah, and they also were like causing calluses on the outside of your ear and stuff. Right. But speaking of six point nine, the danger level of the room <laughs> goes from a six to a nine, and then you start seeing the vitals of who we now are absolutely confirmed is juggernaut based on the size of the individual start going off and then a full-blown alarm goes off i thought this was going to literally just start as him busting out of his cell same oh well the only reason i didn't is because like the thumbnails and stuff kind of spoiled this i was like oh this is not a juggernaut episode <laughs> i actually don't remember what the thumbnails for this one looked like and the the whoever the designer is for disney plus pick some interesting images because when you're looking it up at least on the the computer version for disney plus it was just like casual storm in the background oh that's interesting because uh, she's not even in this episode she <laughs> hasn't she wasn't in the last episode she's not in this episode but there's just like storm in non-gear and i'm like what is and it had nothing to do with it so i was not spoiled by the thumbnail on this one but the security guards enter the room i thought the security guard was evil instantly i thought the dude was evil the way they framed him he was like in the shadow and his eyes were showing and stuff yeah i thought it was going to be like a mystique reveal or something like that point blank but no it was just a, a guy who was kind of like an asshole security guard it was kind of the vibe i got off of him and there's two scientists who are like yeah containment is fucked the scientist also really well drawn. I thought he was going to be an actual character, not just a throwaway person. Right. I guess that's credit to Steven because he said he's the he was a character designer right on the show. Yeah. So that he and, like yeah, like it was it was like, oh, that looks like a real person. That wasn't just arbitrary background image person. Yeah. And no. the vat the juggernauts in, I don't know what else to call it, like coming up. And I guess that's part of the protocol or like either it was automatic or they did it. Like when the system was failing, they like lift him out of the containment thing. Yeah. I think it's just so you could kind of see if he's moving kind of scenario. Like it's probably safer than him just suddenly busting out and you have no warning. Right. <laughs> and the scientist is like, well, what are we going to do? And the security guard is like, well, I've got to make a call. And then you actually see Juggernaut twitching slightly. And that's when we cut to the animated intro. Is it just me or have the recent episodes like the previous week in this one been really, really fast cold opens by comparison to some of the other ones? Like some this of the other ones I felt were like five minutes long. Yeah, this one was definitely really quick because it was basically just like oh shit juggernaut's getting out again all right let's start this episode so episode formally kicks off they're in the institute xavier is telling everybody to get downstairs immediately the kids all recognize the name of the officer and then oh does this mean there's going to be another juggernaut thing xavier says no no but his thing has begun to fail and cyclops is like all right cool let's get suited up and ready in five and i'm like you guys are usually ready in less than five minutes you guys change into your ep like your outfits so quickly yeah but xavier's like no no i'm gonna go alone so aurora was in upstate with her sister last episode this episode she's in africa and logan is on the open road <laughs> So he's like, cool, Scott and Jean, you're in charge solely from being the oldest ones here. This goes back to what I said a few episodes ago. We're like, why do they leave all these children alone at home? And you know, like, I know they're teenagers, but for this precise reason, why do you leave them alone? Right. I feel like you should not have a scenario where two of the three adults is missing. Like I get, OK, cool. Wolverine needs to go somewhere or Storm needs to go somewhere or Xavier goes somewhere. But if you have an instance where two of them have to leave for whatever reason at the same time, you're just asking for shit to hit the van. I like the description of Logan, too. Is like It was just in his tone of voice. Xavier's like, Logan's on the open road somewhere. He's like, just fucking around, like, trying to find himself or some shit. Yep, trying to <laughs> trying to romance the, the new burlier saber tooth. 
Oh, I need some more song suggestions. If anybody wants to comment of like what to put in that little clip of them, like hopelessly in love. The last time it was "If You're Not the One" by Daniel Bedingfield, and that was like pretty spot on. But I, I feel that like was solid. There. Yeah, maybe for this one you do "Here I Go Again" on my own. <laughs> and see if that changes the tone of it, because then it's like the breakup of the two of them separated from each other. Here just have go. it play in reverse. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> yeah. Let, let's just ruin that scene for eternity. <laughs> I feel like we're making it better. TikTok thinks it's better. YouTube yeah. did not like the last one. Oh, really? Okay. I didn't hear those. <laughs> it was more so that nobody reacted to it, sadly. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yes, YouTube doesn't like your your music humor, Rod. <laughs> but yeah, so Scott and Gene are in charge, Xavier leagues, and then I couldn't tell if he was being sarcastic or if he was legit, but Scott was like, yeah, how about some early morning calisthenics training? And everybody's like, no, we're going back to bed. Go fuck yourself. And then Gene calls him Professor S. Yeah, that was funny. Yeah. I think he was serious. I do too, and I hate it. Because we talked about like how they're up, they have to do all this shit before school, and like that's not a quick hour, right, to be in the danger room. So if it was like three or four in the morning, that's probably not too far off for when they had to be up to do that anyway, right? I don't know if you do it, it if you do, if you do it at like six in the morning for a half hour and school starts at eight thirty, maybe that's the way it works out. I don't know. I feel like they don't have enough, especially with all the new students who we still haven't gotten formal introductions to the majority. I feel like there's probably a a big limitation on like showers and stuff at this point. <laughs> That's true. Oh, yeah, because they showed last time it was only a one-person bathroom. Right. Kitty, Kitty couldn't get Rogue out of there. That's right. Yep. So at the jail, we see Xavier is is talking with, with everybody, and, you know, there's essentially going to be a 20-second reboot that they need to, to get everything working, and that his paralysis shouldn't wear off that quickly. That's, like, we talked about it. Like, that's, like, basically torture. Like, this guy is held in suspended animation against his will. Yeah, and now he's hearing him say that. It's like, well, he might have a moment to break free. Although that this is one of those things I was talking about, though, where like, I feel like it was a little bit more sophisticated writing. That's such a great suspense device. We have 20 seconds. It's like defusing the bomb, but in reverse, kind of. But- yeah, the bomb, that, the bomb that is not just going to blow up, but then murder everybody after it blows up, too. Yeah, so he, he's like, he's going to like basically start the detonation but then has 20 seconds to like undetonate it. Like, and that was, that was a cool moment of tension. So jumps back to the school and we see Taryn coming on to Scott really hard. She's frisky. Yeah. Wants to see his eyes finally. And she starts guessing what colors it's going to be under. And he's like, beat red. It was a late night. And I'm <laughs> like, oh my God, dude, you are so awkward. Also, I'm not so sure if Taryn was exactly talking about his eyes. And we had the moment that we've been waiting for. <laughs> I'm back. All, yep. Uh, so I, I know in this instance she is because he's always wearing sunglasses. That's weird, you know, to have a kid in school, like, always wearing sunglasses indoors. Yeah, with with no teacher being like, you have to take those off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I, I didn't know if this was this way everywhere, but I remember in grade school, this was probably even, like, in the 80s. My parents one day sent me with sunglasses, like, around my neck, just as, like, a how they dress me or whatever, and I got in <laughs> trouble for that. Why is there not a picture of that? I don't know. I have to ask my mom. There might be. It's stuff. I remember why it was, though, was the... I don't know if you remember Pizza Hut. Well, you didn't go to Pizza Hut. They gave away these sunglasses. That's a like, sin to my people, sir. <laughs> yeah, that, it was like it was kind of like the X Men thing, where like for if you bought a pizza, then for two dollars extra you got a VHS. But this was a different promotion, where like you got a pizza for like two extra dollars, you got these like you probably recognize them. You saw them. They were like the really like hard angle sunglasses that are neon pink and yellow on each lens. Yeah, and that's what they were selling or giving away. At least where I was, I don't know if it was exactly like gang paraphernalia, but it was like they the teachers then considered it like too on edge. You know, so I I just love the thought of them being worried about you being in a gang right. because of your Pizza Hut sunglasses yeah, at like nine years old. And now the only perception I have for the, what those teachers thought were gangs were like the T-Birds and the Scorpions from Greece. Right. <laughs> Like, if you had a leather jacket and your hair was slicked to the side, they were genuinely worried. Yeah, or like, you know, in Goofy movie, Pete calls Goofy and tells him, or not Pete, the principal calls Goofy and tells him that Max is dressed up like a gangster. Oh, yeah, and that he's going to end up in the electric chair. Yeah, yeah. but, but yeah. He, was, he was just dressed up like, essentially like Michael Jackson in that universe, right? Like, he's like a pop star. So he keeps <laughs> outside glasses. I'm going to name a cover band after that. You'd probably get a cease and desist from it. Hey, any promo, right? Yeah. So Taryn is like leaning in pretty hot and heavy on Scott. And at that point, we see that Gene is on the other side of the bulletin board and looks pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, she's eavesdropping and very purposefully. So she's clearly jealous. So 
Taryn is like, well, I guess I gotta go and wants to learn more about Scott's secrets. And Scott has another <laughs> awkward line. We've all been there and we all did the dumb shit like he did too, but now you're like, oh, you could have not fucked that up and been a much happier person. I forget what the line was. What do you say? <laughs> well, now I don't know it off the top of my uh, head, Rod. <laughs> but it was essentially something like, oh yeah, that'll be, fuck. Well, leave that awkwardness in okay. it because now, yep, thanks, Rod. Ruined the whole episode for me. Hey, um, hey, hey comment what the line was of the engagement. They're not going to look it up. Maybe somebody remembers. Joe Russo, if you're still listening after your successful strike, definitely let us know what that line was. So Gene kind of like is looking and Scott comes around from the other side and Gene immediately jumps to, oh, well, I wasn't spying, yeah. which makes stuff worse because why would Scott have thought you were spying until you said the words spying and then they did some really creative camera work in the show twice in this episode where there's a reflection in Scott's glasses and Taryn is walking off and he's like oh you were spying does that mean you're jealous and then Gene gets really uncomfortable and like walks off in a huff and Scott is like very proud of himself yeah, finally tables have turned. So that's gonna be that's gonna be the volley for this season, I guess, back and forth. Like which one gets jealous. I mean, jealous. this episode alone has like seven of that same volley. Jumps over and there is apparently like computer software class. And somehow Kitty has broken three computers by trying to program. The teacher is talking shit about it. I think that means that Kitty was too good and she actually just overloaded the computers, which couldn't handle her awesomeness that's because okay. schools always had shitty computers. That's true. Or I, I just took it as like she just kept phasing through them or something. Was that the... <laughs> I didn't get that impression, but that is entirely possible. Oh, hey, I just got a notification. I feel like you appreciate this. Your pre-order of Mortal Kombat Legends Cage Match starring Johnny Cage is now available. Your favorite character. Why is there a Mortal Kombat pre-order? The game came out like over a month ago now. This is Johnny Cage in the 80s. We're going to find out what happened. Oh, he's awful. As my favorite character, he was awful in the 80s. I guarantee yeah. that's what the story is. On the other side of the computer class, Risty is with a character. Did you know anything about that character before they said his name? No, I, I'm not familiar. I, I caught two things that he called himself Arcade, but she said his last, I'm assuming his last name is Weber. Right. So Arcade in the comics is a character who his actual name is not revealed. Like I, I, I double checked. I'm like, wait, what is his, his alias? And essentially he builds murder rooms. Oh, so that's really, you know, connects with this episode. Yeah. Like literally he builds elaborate hunger games, squid games, saw style worlds, like big buildings and stuff like that. So this is like prior reference to that. I'm assuming it's not like a origin story. Or, I don't know. I would be pleasantly surprised if later in the season, he just tries to murder them all on purpose. <laughs> right. But yeah, like one of the, the recent books that came out, it was called Murder World, which is the obviously wasn't going to fly for a Saturday morning cartoon, but it was a multi-part book where essentially, you know, squid game elimination style, all these people go and enter it and they all just start getting offed as they're going through like, these different environments in this like giant fake mm -hmm. warehouse thing so and so cool. like at one point it's he has every version of wolverine as the like robots that are killing people oh geez yeah you i don't think you would enjoy it rod no i mean we've established this before if you haven't heard from me before i always tell friends especially when we didn't know what was happening in 2020 if there's like a post-apocalyptic situation or whatever if I lose my glasses, nature just takes me back. There's no like, he rose to the occasion to survive moment. Like I'm in that panning over the city. I'm the third corpse. You know, they're like 20 years ago, the virus or the horde of Wolverine robots took over. I, I didn't make it like that. There, there was something online the other day where it was essentially like, I think it was John Green. And it was like, well, what are you doing if the zombie, he goes, I am running face first into the horde. <laughs> yeah, get it over with, or just find them all. If I'm gonna go, I might as well go in a comfortable place. Right. This, this shows me that you have not watched enough zombie fiction if you think the mall is a good idea, Rod. So, yeah, so we, we see him, he's getting into a game, and then the computer teacher does the thing that no computer teacher would do, and just hard turns off the, the computer, like, with a manual switch. Yeah. I feel like that's the one teacher who would not just do it because you know you fuck up a computer if you do that too many times, you know? But maybe she doesn't know because she's actually the tennis coach. Probably. It's, it's <laughs> actually an athletic school and no yeah. teacher is qualified aside from Beast. Yeah. And yeah. they just got lucky with Beast. They didn't know he was scholarly. They just knew he was Jack. 
Yeah, he's like, oh, this football player. And he's like, I could teach chemistry. They're like, sure you can. That's <laughs> yeah. cute. He's like, and then he's like, he proves the stereotype because he teaches kids how to make stink bombs on the first day. Right. Our head cannon on the show is fantastic. <laughs> so as class is over, Risty is is running out to catch up with Kitty, asking about any weekend plans. And then Kitty says the party circuit is dead. And then Risty plants the idea. It's like, oh, be nice if we had somebody with like no parents around. In a giant house. Who could throw that party. I don't know if I was just, I was probably just part of the lame crew at this age, but like, I wasn't looking for a party every single weekend. Like, that seems insane. I mean, I started DJing in high school almost as soon as I got my license. I was literally like being paid to, you know, DJ dances and bar mitzvahs and weddings and stuff like that. So I wasn't as worried about it because I actually was making money in high school without needing to work at like an Abercrombie or something like that. So oh, nice. Yeah, yeah I, I just I remember having like special occasions, you know, like we would have like a bonfire overnight or a party at a friend's house or something for like the fall or something. And then we had school dances almost every month. But I remember just like having a rager at <laughs> friends' houses, you know, like every single week. See, I went to private school. I feel like my perspective was skewed because I would always hear like public school kids who I was friends with would be like doing the house ragers. And the one thing that was always consistent was the house would get fucked up inevitably. And that wasn't just the trope. It was like something would always get broken or somebody's parents would come home. Kitty, Nightcrawler and Evan start talking about it. And they they are like, yeah, let's have a party. And well, the professor's way, the kids are going to play. And then Rogue being like the downer is like, <laughs> yeah, uh, reality check, guys. There's Scott and Jean. And then Nightcrawler says something that I never would have ever thought would be the reaction of, well, what are X-Men if not problem solvers? And I'm like, I, I don't know if that is necessarily the calling of your group at this yeah, point. You, have, you haven't earned that yet, dude actually start a lot more issues <laughs> yeah yeah you you guys are at the very least the target of people i don't know if i would necessarily call you problem solvers but then rogue closes her her locker and did you see what the magazine said no i didn't goth topic oh that's hilarious so it was the least thinly veiled reference possible yeah and that's yeah. when hot topic was still kind of goth oh yeah 2001 that was absolutely yeah, still it's goth era yeah, we had like the distressed like logo. Yeah. When when did it start to move away? Probably 2009 or 10 was when it started to like I feel like it was so gradual we didn't notice. It was like there was one day when all of a sudden they had like Disney stuff in there and it was mm -hmm. like you looked around and everything else was like, "Oh no, this actually fits in here now." Right. But back at the prison, there's like 30 guards around the cell and all I could think is they're all gonna die yeah what are they gonna do but again like we kind of talked about it like is there just like the equivalent of the fbi when it comes to superpowered beings that like they know xavier has a connection to him they know he's a civilian and they know he's super powered but there's no other talk about superpowered beings in this world is this the most covert op possible kind of scenario that. yeah because they don't know yeah there has to be some connection there where xavier is connected to yeah some subsect of the government that has all that information <laughs> That, that at sense. the very least, they're putting him into a government facility because they know he could shut him down. He's rewiring a motherboard. Let's go with that as the yeah. explanation. And they start the countdown. The juggernaut's eyes opens. The hands start moving. He starts breaking the chain. And then, like, the system comes online just in time. I guess, like, juggernaut was still woozy, essentially. Yeah. That was yeah. part of what I was mentioning before about such great tension because I, you know, you know how the shows are going to go. Like, these characters aren't going to die. This is not going to happen. They're already too far into having major conflict. But, like, I I was still wondering because, like, they did a good job of, like, getting, cutting it right down to the moment because he he broke one of the chains. I was like, oh, he's at least going to get out of this containment unit, if not the prison. And then we get the biggest cock tease of, of the series so <laughs> far because he doesn't actually get out. So we've seen the juggernaut at the point. Like, they basically edged us. And then he's back out cold and Xavier's concerned. He's like, hmm. This wasn't a malfunction. This or this, you know, somebody sabotaged this. I guess he he saw the equivalent of like slashing a tire, like in the thing. We didn't get an explanation, but we're just trusting it. Yeah, which means Mystique did some work, man. I'm guessing she was one of those shitty guards, right? That's that's why I originally that like I said, I thought it was the guard, the original one. Yeah. So, but we see Scott 
at what I described as a like a makeout point, which I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's 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 rewind. Did those exist in your hometown? I don't remember it actually being a thing because we didn't have a lot of like, you know, high points in Greentown, <laughs> Indiana. But Fair. I, I'm Geo- def- geographically, that becomes a challenge. OK, yeah, but I am aware there were definitely versions of that around. I think everybody like, kind of found their own spot because there was a lot of hiding spaces in the country. But he was like that joke on Family Guy of like anal point. I wonder what they do there. Didn't know that joke, but yeah. Well, oh, well th- that, that, this that was... is definitely this is definitely the blue episode of Cyclops is waiting for me. Stewie asked Brian, "We're gonna go up to anal point. I don't know what they do there." And Brian's like, "You know when you like see a tight spot in your garage, and you're like, there's no way, and then you fold in your mirrors, and there you are." But I had the exact same note, and I was like, "I was like, Scott is overlooking out makeout point when Jean gets dropped off. She gets dropped off by." Duncan and then there's like the weird looks back and forth between Duncan like he's still like trying to like alpha male against Scott I didn't which I felt this. like in this episode Scott didn't give as much of a shit yeah especially maybe because like, yeah. he was high on the Terran thing yeah he's got Terran stuff and then I, I keep having to remind myself even though Duncan and Gene are like a thing Gene still lives with Scott that's got to weigh on him too uh, Duncan, oh yeah that's you know. definitely if if you're the I want to be the alpha male bullshit, like jock personality. It's like, fuck, he's still in the same building with her at night. Like that's yeah. definitely what like he's crying about in the shower. I feel like. <laughs> so I, I love the awkward moment here. It was so well written of like, he's like, well, what's up? And I didn't know why she was getting dropped off there either. I was like, this yeah. is a weird scenario for them. Why wouldn't Duncan just drop her off at home? And Scott's like, oh, Kitty said you wanted to to meet up here. And then you see Nightcrawler and Kitty have actually like teleported in. Nightcrawler grabs something. I'm assuming it was like a... The keys like, or something. It wasn't the keys because it... Scott does try turning the car on. It was like a oh, that's right. like a spark plug or something like that gotcha, is, yeah. is what I, I read it as. And then Kitty steals the phone. It, once again, they are just, they're just really leaning into like, these are all rich kids. Yeah. 2001, the cell phone, like you would just carry around with you. Even as an emergency, that's not something like everybody could have. No, it was like if you threw somebody into the pool and they had their phone on them, that was like somebody's parents are going to murder them because right. this was a huge issue and there was no such thing as water resistance. If you sneezed on the phone, it would break from the like liquid in your your you know your mucus, and then they just teleport away. And so yeah, then you're supposed to, you know, you infer that like oh this was set up to distract them for the length of the night. I don't know how long they thought that. this must be really far away for them to like think that they were going to be distracted for the length of a party yeah i i and i think it, it comes down to kurt kitty and evan are all young members of the team so they're just kind of idiots so scott then proceeds to blame gene and that she's jealous of taryn she calls scott an egomaniac and then she turns the table because he's like all right fine let's drive home and then he can't get the car started he's like oh just this big coincidence that the car doesn't work now so you're the one who's trying to trap me up here and talk to me so they're just in a like awful pissing contest right now with each other that would be kind of terrifying though if you like i guess you know scott pretty well but if you're with a guy that's like vying for your attention and all of a sudden like his quote unquote car doesn't work if you were not a psychic. Yes. Oh, that's another good point. I guess I guess she's got boundaries. I don't know. Because she she's, figure that out. She is respecting boundaries. Because we've mm-hmm. seen, like, they tend, aside from Xavier, to not invade people's minds without getting permission. Because the one time it happened the last episode with Rogue, like, even Jean was like, I didn't mean to. At the party, everybody's there, stuff like that. Risty arrives with Arcade, and then I put the students and the new Institute kids are all mingling. It became very hard to tell exactly who was who at that point, because none of them, aside from Boom Boom, have we really gotten a like dramatic look at to be able to spot them, aside from the kid with like the shitty blonde hair. Yeah, I didn't recognize anybody yet, for precisely the reason you said, like we haven't had enough time with them to, to know who's who. And who's just from the regular school. And, like, Bobby looks like generic white boy. Yeah. And then, like, like I don't recall really seeing Wolfsbane, because she has has distinctive hair, but I do recognize, like, there was a kid who I'm pretty sure was Sunspot, so. Oh, okay, I didn't catch. Yeah, I just took it as, like, a a crowd of kids at a plow party. So, 
Risty and Arcade are wandering around. They see an elevator and Risty plants the seed of like, oh, I wonder if that leads to the big computer. And then the one that Rogue was talking about, which, goddamn Rogue, why? Why would you talk about the giant computer? Like, if you don't want things to be like, at least a little bit ambiguous, like. Yeah, the old, the old man in me was like, this is why they shouldn't have parties at the, the mansion. <laughs> Just literally walked onto your front lawn and just start screaming at kids going by on their bicycles. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it's like, you, should, you shouldn't be having parties anyway, but like, especially at this house, like there's like weapons of mass destruction here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that have tried to kill you guys just on their own. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then Arcade is also apparently like a full-fledged hacker and he uses a key card device to hack into the Cerebro room, which tells me they need better security in the entire mansion if one asshole kid is able to hack into it. Yeah, I like how it started off as a biometric reader of his hand, and then he was like, oh, computers are all the same. I guess that was the reason. And then the doors open, and he's like, I guess they're not all the same. Yeah, and then it goes, you see the inside of Cerebro. Cuts back over, Jean is frustrated. She can't find her phone, and Scott's like, well, gotta start walking i'm gonna go ahead and she literally like telekinetically pulls him back like kind of the yeah. opposite of what she did in the last episode where she threw him off a balcony <laughs> and then is like well aren't you coming slow poke and it's like oh you guys are this is not a great day for the two of you yeah i hate each other I it's like all, all because taryn was trying to make out with scott like right. literally scott wasn't doing anything and then he got cocky when he thought that gene was being bothered by him jumps back into cerebro and they finally got the new helmet. Yeah, the one that doesn't look cheap. Yes, because exactly. we were we were very impressed by the redesign of Cerebro, but the first time we saw it, it was the shitty version of the helmet. Now it was a better version of the helmet, and I'm like, okay, that's that that makes sense. That is my Cerebro now. But again, it must not be that great because that kid hacked that helmet to allow him to use it. I think they probably are letting Wolverine handle the security protocols, and he is not a great programmer. You got to remember this version; they don't have a beast. Yeah, uh, yeah, oh yeah, not at the mansion yet. We get the sense from the last episode that Beast is aware of Scott's situation, but we don't sure. get a clear picture of it yet, or if he's attached to the mansion at all. All I know is they built that Cerebro room very, very quickly, so there's right. probably a bunch of dead, like, workmen under the under there, and there was some guy who got dramatically underpaid before he was killed for his work. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, in here when Arcade hacks the Cerebro met and, like, puts it on, my no ear says, and immediately commits massive HIPAA violations. He just starts <laughs> accessing everyone's files. Yeah, I try. I did pause. It was just the what is it? Lipsum, blah blah blah. What's the? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the phrase lip, when there's nothing legible lip, on screen? Lipsumorum or something. Yeah, yeah. It's it the text that like fills in like publication stuff. Yeah, that was basically what was on the screen for everybody because we we did see it is some of the the new members of the team, specifically Wolf Spain's or Wolf Bane's headshot comes up, but. There's nothing written on any of those. And then would somebody actually get the reference now of burn a DVD? Like, is that a phrase that is ever going to be said anymore? I made a note of that. It says Risty talks to Arcade about downloading the info on a DVD. I was like, oh, man. Oh, yeah, because she's like, oh, I wonder what those are. It's probably other characters in the game. And she wants to use those characters in her program for the software class. And it was like, yeah, I'll burn you a DVD. And I'm like, we yeah, literally we just heard that Best Buy is going to stop selling Blu-ray and DVDs at their store. Which is wild because I don't know. It's going to be wild to see what that store is. It's become an appliance store. Yeah, it's it's basically going to become a Sears at that point. Because I don't know if people don't know this, but back in 2010, I had a pretty like, modestly successful like music career as a, a solo artist. And, so and now Buy, you're stuck doing podcasts with me. Right. Yeah. But uh, Best Buy was, at the time, the exclusive distributor. And then later on, Barnes & Noble picked it up. But that's when they had CDs. And I remember that system. But I remember them announcing them stopping selling CDs because obviously mine was pulled out of as lot as with everybody's inventory and stuff. And now they're saying no DVDs or Blu-rays. And like, so what are you... Besides iPhones, like what are you, iPhones, what are you selling? TVs, and refrigerators, man. Yeah, so I guess oh, that's wild. But yeah, the the burning the DVD thing. I to your point, I know that kids these days know that you could burn CDs. I don't know how often burning a DVD is brought up. I feel like that's like that was more of like a movie thing. And yeah. if you had large files, we did it. We burned large files on DVD, but I think that was more of like a thumb drive, hard drive kind of situation. If you could pull it off. 
Yeah, I I felt like we we had DVD burners and we never actually used them for what they were intended to be. I did only because I was at school for music, and so we sometimes we had large files that were like, oh, let's transfer a bunch of this stuff on something that yeah, I, I, it's hard to explain because it was like it was there, so we used it. But yeah, it wasn't super common. No. We, we were in a weird situation. But my note here was, this is definitely Mystique. Because I had the question last episode, I was like, is this Mystique? This one's like, this is definitely Mystique. <laughs> yes, because she's like, cool, I'm going to go back up to the party. I'll check you later. And like, that's actually where we get an animation glitch. And I oh, don't I know notice. if it appeared on it for you. I imagine it would because of the way the upload would have been. As she's walking back towards the camera when he is in the background and she's moving towards the foreground, the overlay of the screen is actually on top of her for like a, oh. like a second or two. And then she's in front of it. That is not how that layout would have actually appeared. Okay, I didn't Notice that. I think it was like kind of one of those like with animation you like you superimpose it on a different layer and her layer she was just like walking through it it was weird yeah they just messed it up for a couple frames so he continues like jumping through stuff and then he sees a program called the danger room like, this is a cool one he, he pulled through a bunch of other like kind of easter eggs like the blackbird and stuff too yeah there was there was like different schematics and like there was you know the the blackbird which I don't think we actually call it the blackbird in this series I think they call it like the X jet or something like that. Okay. And then there was like the random like lifter loader robot thing that we are, we are going to see later in the episode. And then he finds the danger room and you could tell he's like, this is the equivalent of when we were in school and somebody downloaded doom or Duke Nukem or whichever one it was. And then added like the Beavis and butthead mod to it where they oh, were yeah. just like, they were so excited. They're like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm a hacker. Meanwhile, he literally broke security systems with no problem, but the game is yeah. what's fucking getting him a, a nerd boner right now. I remember installing Doom on like our TI-86s or 83, I forget, whatever, the TI, whatever, the graphic calculators and stuff. I feel and like it like had to be thing. the 86 or 87 those are the more to be able to ones, handle right? it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it was those ones, because they had the data cable, and you'd have yep. to wait, like, all night. Jump back over, we see Scott and Gene are sitting in a tow truck. Scott wants him to slow down, because he's he's bumping around, and he's like, yeah, I gotta keep a schedule, and it's like, aren't you literally just, like, driving out when people call you? I can't imagine there are that many people looking for a tow on this night, but okay, it's, whatever. This is the week out, and make out point is real busy with broken down cars. Liter literally, he no. just starts towing cars with kids in them. All right. And then Gene bumps into Scott, and there's, like, that little bit of, like, it felt more like playful antagonism rather than, like, actual jealousy like we've seen from other parts of the episode. Yeah. Like, I, well, I, I actually interpreted that one a little bit like her being flirty. Yeah, that was, that was one of those things where, like, it would have been, for either of them, it would have been really sweet at any other time but this moment. Right. And then, well, we reached the episode, or the part of the episode where I can't read what my note says. My next note says the party just gets real rowdy and they start breaking shit. Like, they broke, like, a, oh, yep. a bust. So, stuff breaking in the main room. I thought it said staff bonding in the main room. I, I should really type out my fucking notes, Rob. I mean, maybe, because also, we've said this before, there has to be a wait staff or, like, like butlers and maids here, right? Because that breakfast that they had in, like, an early episode, that wasn't something the kids thought together. Unless Xavier is mind-controlling one of the kids at three in the morning to do it, I agree totally. Ooh, what if it's all of them? They all go back to sleep and then wake up ten minutes yeah, later. they're all severanced in their own home. I still have to watch that. I still do, too, but I, I, I know the overall concept. Right. <laughs> I hope I'm using that correctly. <laughs> So yes, yeah, stuff is breaking in the main room. There is nervous rogue. And then an alarm starts to go off and everybody makes it into their costume to go down to the danger room. And they, they, they got that hallway and gets murdered or whatever, right? You when you time. walk through it and you get to the other side, you're in your, your full uniform. Yeah, yeah, magic. Yeah, I mean, there's got to be some unstable molecules or something that they're able <laughs> to change that quickly. Ask any cosplayer, you put on an outfit like that, that is not a quick change. There's no, Everything is tight. It, like... It doesn't jump on super quick. So Kurt is going is going to try to get in there. He teleports in. He looks shocked for a second, and then there's a zap, and like everybody's like waiting for Kirk to like pop out on the other side. And it's like, hmm, this is awkward. If this was the '92 series, I would have thought they would have morphed him, you know, like because <laughs> yeah, he got shot by a laser meant to kill. I mean, it's also very reminiscent of how the morph shot takes place too. Yeah, where you don't see it happen, and then this kid running it. Is shooting to kill because he thinks it's a video game. Yeah. So Kitty phases in, 
she sees Kurt down and then phases everybody else inside. And then Arcade gets super excited because he's like, cool, more players. And I was like, wait, does he think it's a multiplayer game right now? Yeah, it's like an online thing. Is that? I remember LAN parties, but I don't remember being able to like play with someone like across the world on a game like that. I felt like you would have need to have like found a server and then logged in. There wasn't like easy matchmaking in 2001. Yeah, yeah. or I guess maybe he just thought it was the system AI or something. Yeah. But yeah, so he thinks he's killing bots, hopefully. And then a bunch of death traps start happening. I don't need to go into the detail on the death traps, but I did love how it's like every time we've seen the danger room, it just gets like progressively worse and deadlier to the point where there's like a saw blade that cuts through Evan's spikes. Yeah. So so it's like, oh, if that's cutting through Evan's spikes, that means it's cutting through Evan. That was kind of funny physics, too, because Evan knocks out some of those saw blades with other spikes. I guess it's just like, you know, velocity and all that stuff. I think it was because it was a bigger spike or a bigger saw blade. Yeah, yeah. And it could have hit him. It does kind of like ricochet and go vertical into the wall instead of the horizontal shot that it was. So Rogue and Evan are able to get to Kurt. Kitty is running away and she keeps phasing in. And then this is, I, I think I referenced it loosely in the last episode where Kitty doesn't pay attention when she unphases because she runs through like six walls. And then in between the sixth and the seventh one, she decides to unphase and knocks herself out. I wonder about that, I guess. Yeah, I guess it was just that she got distracted or freaked out. And then, yeah. Which also the reference that I hate making kind of reminds me a little bit of the inverse of what we would see in X-Men Last Stand, where Juggernaut is running through tons and tons of walls until the final room where he gets knocked out when he lost his powers. Then they, they're they basically like, what would you call it? Like a moat almost pops up. And then these two giant balls are rushing at them from two different sides. And Kurt wakes up just in time to teleport everybody out of there. It gets almost like Super NES version of Danger Room. You know, like a game. So there is, if Rod, if you look at our bonus episode list of stuff we will explore at some point, Spider-Man and X-Men Arcade's Revenge is literally about arcade. I think I remember. Okay, so now this is coming together because I think I remember renting that game when I was a kid. Because I remember that cover. Never played it, but that that's it's effectively like an arcade style danger room because his. It's his face like hovering over the X-Men in the cover, right? And he has like red hair, maybe? He does have red hair. I, I don't I, remember the cover, but he does have red hair. I, if we if we end up playing it for this, I'm going to, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll remember if I actually rented it or if I just saw it in the store because I, I have some memory of that game. Right. I didn't put together that, that was the same arcade. That is all coming together now. See, this is the reason like you can't have me like narrate like a comic book series because I only remember after someone tells me. So arcade is a little bit pissed off. You know, he's 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 sad he didn't win by killing the real yeah. human beings. And DEFCON 4 goes off, which I don't know why it went off. That was actually the only part of the episode I was confused about is at this point, why does the system think it's compromised? Like, was that him setting it off or was it just like, hmm, there seems to be so much chaos. We need to kill the entire institute right. or like one of his hacks like fell through because he was like hardwiring a lot of stuff. Right. The helmet. So at that point, you know, an alarm is going off and that's when Scott and Jean return and they both realize what's going on. They kind of like apologize to each other. And then they see that all the doors in the windows start closing. Like the magic is locked out. Like, well, that can't be good. And then Rod, let's let's talk about the music for a second, because the song that was playing at this point and there were like three distinct spots in this episode where there are legitimate songs going on. I swear to God, this was a song from Beck. Like, I know it wasn't actually oh. Beck, but it sounded like somebody who was like aping or like giving tribute to Beck's style of, of music. I have to go back and listen to it. But uh, we talked a little bit before recording about this. and I'll just put this in the broadest terms so I don't like set expectations for this person. But I talked about like it'd be interesting if I could track the composer for the show and ask a few questions if they're allowed to talk about it. A lot of times some of this stuff is kind of hush hush. But like right. there's some things that I kind of I'm guessing that happened and I don't want to call too many out in case I'm like wrong or I like put the idea out there when it's not based on any truth but like oh so you're actually being a responsible like reporting right, like yeah. journalist quote unquote on this scenario yeah. good just yeah. based on what I know about music because I do like you know I do a lot of music that's uncredited but for pay 
And, you know, honestly, a lot of that credit goes to friend of the show, Ron Wasserman, because he kind of advised me on that too. He's like, you want credit or you want to pay bills? I was like, yes, I would like to eat. I like he gave you an A, an A, B scenario and your answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> it would be really interesting to hear where these songs came from. I, I feel like that if it were me, it would have been like projects that I had that I knew wouldn't have homes anywhere else, you know, that would never move forward that I had some, I had enough ownership of to like place in something like this. But yeah, like to your point, like at least a verse of the chorus had to be finished for all these needle drop songs in the show, not just this episode. Cause we, we there was like one time it happened with Dazzler, maybe one right. other time in the 92 series and this show we, this is like our fourth or fifth song that just listening to on the radio and this one in particular literally i heard three distinctly different songs too yeah <laughs> so or so, if anybody happens is listening and knows some insight about the songs in the show that'd be just interesting here even if it's like i, I don't know yeah, yeah whatever insight you might have i'm just not familiar well, with the show so i don't know where it's coming from I mean, we'll do some IMDb pro research. One of the two of us has an active account, at least at this point. So, because otherwise I'd become John Carl 2 on IMDb pro, and I am not oh, okay no. with that. John Carl 1 got credited for three things I did actually work on, but had only ever done like sound on some independent film in 1999. And I'm like, <laughs> I'll, I'll be damned if I am not John Carl 1 on fucking IMDb. Right. So, nobody inside gives a shit or notices there's one dude in the main lobby who as all the doors and windows are closing is like passed out on the couch and then in the other like grand hall room everybody else is just dancing and like don't care that the windows are closing around them or not at all freaked I, out by it i don't think i even notice i think they're just partying i mean there's definitely one point where there's like two people dancing who I think are the kids from the Institute do not give a shit. They literally like it is within their eye line that those things fucking close and they just don't care. Nope. Kids are idiots. And then outside a bunch of the defenses, including the fountain in front of the, the Institute, just everything starts to try to murder them. Yeah. Yeah. Gene and Scott. So it's funny. Like Gene and Scott were actually trying not to have this situation at a party happen. And then they're the, the ones that have to deal with the, consequences i think that's like symbolic and probably very purposeful in this episode oh yeah no doubt so right around that point where the defenses are all being activated risty is going into the hangar and one of the robot mech things does a non-lethal shot at her knocks her into a wall and when that happens we get the reveal of mystique which like we alluded to in the last episode but also I felt like they they changed the character design slightly from the reveal at the end of season one. Yeah, yeah. she was a regular Ruben <laughs> Stamos. She had a different outfit. I guess that was just like she went off and, you know, did more shit or whatever. But she did look different. I guess they... I wonder, you know, Steven had mentioned last episode that Mystique was one of the characters they had to kind of rush on. So, right. like, I wonder if this was, like, what he wanted to have time to work on, like, her quote-unquote, like, final form. Yeah, which he, he didn't get the chance to do for the finale because they were turning it around so fast, probably from design from the movie and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. You see the gold DVDR or plus R, because we don't ever know if it's plus or minus. That's another thing, kids. There were two types and sometimes hybrids. To this day, I don't even know why. There, were, there was off. also the rewritable or the one-time write only. Yeah, yeah, the rewritables, man. What a terrible God, idea. Man. Oh, it was always so bad. That's why we lost so much media is because people used, re used rewritable shit. And also, like, five years after you did it, the burn wasn't as good on most of it. So that yeah, was the whole it, thing, too. And it peeled off because it was that foil on top. Everybody's still partying. Nobody gives a fuck. Scott and Gene have already moved into, into gear because yeah. of the magic of, of television. They're just dealing with more defenses. And then I still don't understand how the waterfall works right i don't understand where crazy. the water is coming from and this is one of the times where i wish there was video because i'm literally making hand <laughs> motions to a person who i can't even see their reaction <laughs> god damn it rod and they basically jump off the the cliffside together avoiding one attacking robot they shoot their way into the launch bay which tells me that the launch door is not very secure if Scott is very easily able to break through it, and then they get attacked by a shitty robot. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm guessing it's similar defenses that Steek was knocked out by. That's my thought. It was the the loader droid we saw the schematic of with Arcade. Is That's how I, I saw it. Mystique regains consciousness just in time, is able to stay hidden, grabs the DVD as Scott and Jean are headed towards the other direction, and then she runs out towards the waterfall. Yeah, I guess we don't really know how she gets out. Cause that's kind of high. But she's, I mean, she she's again, worse. she's the one who's transformed into cats and fucking birds that's and all true. that stuff. She probably just turned into a crow or something. Yeah, or a raven. A raven, that's right. Yeah, so <laughs> that's what she did last time. Yep. And then we get a X transition as opposed to the flash transitions, which we confuse <laughs> as psychic feedback sometimes. <laughs> and Arcade is just using all the death traps that he can. You should try to kill the X kids. It goes back to that video. Man, now that you told me that that's the game, I could I can't get that image of that game's cover out of my head. This all uh, makes so much sense more to, you know now. Like we always do, reminder for John, look up that image and add it to the Instagram feed. Because he, he kind of looked like, what's his name from Mad Magazines? Yes, Alfred E. Newman. Yes, yeah. He, Is he, that he, actually the right name? That sounds right. I think that's right. It was something like that. Looks like he, okay, here's the thing. I don't know what the time frame is going to be but jackie earl haley would crush it as this character as an adult in the Ooh. in live action there you go so gene or they end up in in one of the rooms and gene realizes she's locked out of the computer saying that all the security is tied to cerebro and they're able to to still get in and, and see a feed of of cerebro and they're like oh that must be Kitty's friend. And that's when Kitty pops up and he's like, yeah, he's this gamer. His name is like Arcade. And Gene's like, oh, interesting. Maybe you shouldn't have had a party guest here. Right. So there's like a little bit of an awkward moment of she's like, well, yeah, but I don't know how he got into the big room that's trying to kill all of us. And then Arcade hacks himself on the camera and sees himself with them looking at him on the screen. And it was like, it was it was actually really thought provoking of how they, they framed that up. Oh, I did realize the other really cool shot when Scott and Gene were having a little bit of their back and forth, you saw their interaction reflected on their windshield as shit is happening in the car. Oh, that was the other scene said, I was talking about yeah. earlier. With Arcade seeing himself, he even says like feedback wave. Yeah. And then he like literally is waving at himself on the screen to himself. And he's like, oh, they're all looking at me. This is so cool. And then he electrocutes them. Yeah. That I, is what, like, what, how good of technology he, he think that games were at that point? Right? You saw the game that was on the, the computer he was playing. Like, was he just that disconnected from reality that he was just like, oh, this is the greatest computer ever. I just have a really shitty computer. Yeah. So and then so he electrocutes them and then Scott shoots the monitor. And yeah. that's where I realized Scott doesn't understand technology He's because like, they're just... shooting everything except for the camera, which they saw what the view of the camera was when they saw him. Yeah. So they run out of the room. They nobody dies and they're just shooting everything. And <laughs> then they finally shoot the like the drone that's following them as the camera. They get to Cerebro. They teleport to him and Rogue touches him and he passes out. And I think that might have been the first time a girl has touched Arcade. So he might not even pass out from her powers. <gasps> yeah, it's literally just the touch of a woman. That's why he was so easily manipulated by Risty because he's like, oh, goth girl's into me. Yeah, British goth girl. Yeah, it's British goth girl. So everybody starts leaving and they're like saying goodbye to the last group of kids. Evan is pissed that they missed the party. Kurt is sad that they ate all his food. And that just tells me that Kurt has never thrown a party before. Right. Because the one thing you learn is if you throw a party, you get none of your own food. You have, you have to feed everybody else separately. Dude, one of the things that would drive me insane. So for those of you that don't know, for years, I would host with the company I was working for one of the biggest parties at VidCon. Do it at the House of Blues in Anaheim. And they had great food, specifically chicken and waffles, which I freaking <laughs> love. Most years, I would not get to eat at my own party because I was running around and taking care of the guests and, oh, yeah. and, and all that stuff. And there was no greater moment than one night at the end of one of them, everybody's out and we're all exhausted. And I've had my share of vodka and Red Bull, but I have had no actual food in my stomach. And somebody just pulled out like, a, like a little plate of chicken and waffles that was set aside for me. And it was the greatest 2 a.m. possible. It was a good hangover food too. It was all carby and greasy. Oh, so much carbs. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. While 
Kurt and, and Kitty and Evan realize they need to start the whole cleanup of everything. You see Scott, Gene, and Rogue who are with Arcade. And Arcade starts apologizing. And he's like, yeah, man, like, I'm sorry, but that game was just so awesome. I didn't mean to go into a spot that I wouldn't have. And Rogue is, like, kind of the first one to realize it. She's like, wait, what? Like, and then they almost let the cat out of the bag. But Xavier comes in just in time properly manipulates into Arcade's mind, realizes that he's telling the truth and he gives the heads up to everybody else. No, no, he actually believes it was a video game. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, like telepathically. He's yeah. like, he still thinks it's a game, guys. <laughs> yeah, so he's like, yep, we got, a, we got a taxi ready to take you home. So Arcade, after almost murdering the X-Men, locking a bunch of people in a house that probably would have murdered them once the mm -hmm. X-Men were taken care of and definitely destroyed cars on the front lawn, but that's completely not addressed. I didn't think about that, yeah. Those cars definitely got fucked up. There's no I, way. I was for sure that Xavier was going to mind wipe all those kids, but those kids left the party not even knowing that any of the lockdown stuff happened. And <laughs> That just tells me this was a high-end like school district. Yeah, There was like what would it have been at the time? Like, was Molly popular yet, or was it just E at that point? Uh, I, I was out of loop on drugs. I'm trying to think, like, back to the DJ days of what drugs I saw people on. When I, when I was at high school, I, I did a video about this on my channel. The worst we ever got into was burying beer in the cornfields. Terrible <laughs> idea, by the way, because it gets real hot. So I could, I could honestly say I've never done anything beyond weed. Mm -hmm. I don't judge those who did. But I do remember very specifically, like senior year of high school and and freshman year of college ecstasy was just all over the fucking place at that point yeah. and i guarantee these kids like well off neighborhood in in westchester they definitely had ecstasy at sense. this party yeah so that's why they all drove home which is great so you get kind of like the the little moment of scott who's like no, nah, I I fucked up, and it's like, well, no, you got manipulated by kids, so you didn't necessarily fuck up, but you're not that great of a babysitter. And then Xavier's like, no, everybody's to blame. It was the closest to the we're all freaks from Storm in oh, '92 yeah. for me. It's like, no, everybody gets blamed for this, not just you. Yeah, yeah. This was so. There's plenty of blame to share or something. Yeah, I I, I couldn't grasp if he included himself in that because also you are a grown ass adult that left a bunch of teenagers. Alone a a bunch of super powered power. teenagers. Literally, yeah. Rod, have you watched Gen V yet? No. Okay. I don't think you will because it's it doesn't seem like your taste, but it's like this is what happens in the R-rated version of this show. It's okay. it's it is horny college age superheroes. Yeah, I can see it. I remember oh, what was the show? Man, it was it was kind of like heroes but British. Misfits misfits yes where it was like a little bit more raw and like what well, kind of actually happened if you know people suddenly manifest the powers out of nowhere yeah. and, and got crazy yeah well on that and gen v there's a lot of banging because it's yeah. people in college so yeah yeah but then xavier's like yeah so there was definitely a mystery guest around they were the the one who was behind all of this and then we see mystique who's in like almost like a toad like pose like on one of the the pillar is outside and she jumps off the fence and then she goes like back into wristy mode and then wanders off mm -hmm. obviously still holding her her very very important yeah. dvd and it's not the case i think it's the thing that drove me crazy it's like you just burned a dvd that thing is fragile as shit <laughs> yeah dude i remember like as soon as dvds were burned like you put them like you you gave them time to like cool and we may have been overcompensating and not realizing they were safer than they were but i just remember everybody's like oh don't fuck it up don't fuck it up so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it had a freshly burned smell oh yeah definitely a freshly burned <laughs> smell but yeah so that is the end of the episode i do like we've talked about this the show does a good job of alternating like positive endings of episodes like what we got in the last one and mm -hmm. then this one's like a little bit more sinister and then some are a little bit more sad. Like, it kind of jumps between them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, this is a fun one. Like I said, like, I, I enjoyed this one more than, I guess, the IMDb Raiders. Because I thought it was clever writing. You pointed out some cool, like, kind of, I don't know, camera shots are the right, right way to describe it. But, like, just framing. I think, I think it's, yeah, the framing and the shots are, like, mm -hmm. it, it actually had cinematic aspects to it. Like, I think that was one of the things that 92 and Batman, the animated series, were very early into 
Okay. So you would get cool shots, but it would be still traditional animation because they were still doing it out of like studios in Korea and, and stuff like that. This was a new animation style. Like you were you were treating it like it was a movie or an ep- like an episode of like IRL people on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed it a lot. I'm excited to see like where it, it left a lot of it started a lot of stories. I guess that I'm hoping that's gonna you know pay off later. So. The next episode we have, if you look at the title, it absolutely spoils what character we're going to dive deeper into in the next episode. Oh, okay. I haven't seen it yet. (laughs) Advanced advanced warning. It is crystal clear who the character is from the title. But for me, now, now I'm ready to start deep diving on some of these other characters. Like, we got Boom Boom, and I want to start seeing the other new kids in the Institute. Yeah, I, yeah I don't love them being relegated to background characters. And maybe it's just because I'm familiar with the majority of them, and I know how good their stories can be. So now I'm ready to start exploring them. Yeah, especially with this high school twist. Right? Like, are those kids in the high school? That's or are they, like, the other. freaks in the Institute? Like, I don't know what their actual role is yet. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have that open... Like, Boom Boom's the Beast. only one we've seen in the school. Yeah, that's true. And then we have that open end with Beast, which I'm sure he's going to show up soon, too. So I've in... I have had another character from an image spoiled for me from, like, classic X-Men 2, so... Oh, no, nice. Yeah, I mean, granted, like we talk about, there's a show that came out over 20 years ago. How do we not get some of it spoiled on us, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Also TikTok. But thank you guys for joining us. Just as a reminder, tune in to, to Whiskey and Waffles on Twitch this upcoming weekend, the first weekend of November. There will also be a link if you want donations for a great cause, and... I can make myself sick off of smearing off ice. If you have any thoughts on this show, make sure to drop them into the comments for the YouTube upload or the official Instagram for this episode. And also I've, I've been throwing up every now and then a random poll on Spotify for those who listen on Spotify. Answer those. Who else do you want us to have on as guests? Because we were thrilled to have Stephen E. Gordon on. We want to have more people. I definitely want to hit up some of the voice actors from some of the various shows. We got shit to do until you know x-men 97 comes out at the very least and if you like what you heard we'd appreciate a rating on the podcast app of your choosing find us on apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, amazon music spotify google Podcasts, Castbox, and i almost fell asleep in the middle of that sentence rod i think we're done for tonight <laughs> was taryn talking about scott's eyes <laughs> she's talking about the color of them rod it has to be the eyes Maybe. if it's not she doesn't understand basic anatomy 